Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Soybean Planting Technologies for Improving On-Farm Productivity. My name is Chris Boomsma. I'm Director of Education at the American Society of Agronomy and the Soil Science Society of America, and it's my host to be today's moderator and to bring you this webinar. Before we get started, a thanks to our sponsors. Today's sponsor is the United Soybean Board. We strongly appreciate and really um, are happy about the sponsorship because it makes it free to you, the webinar attendee. Without their sponsorship, this would not be uh, possible. And I'll have a little bit more to say about USB and their support of this webinar after um, our presenter today gets done. So before we get started, some quick notes, as always, with our webinar series. First, please contact Michelle Lovejoy if you have any issues with course content, registration, anything technical. Maybe you have a problem with GoToWebinar and we can try to resolve that as quickly as possible so that you can get back to the webinar and here and see everything properly. So her email and telephone number are on your screen right now. Secondly, we ask you to please type your questions in the questions box and submit them to the organizer, which is myself, at any time. I will take those questions, put them in order, screen them, and then present them to our presenter at the end where he will um, answer all those, hopefully. And if we have any left over, he will provide his contact information so you can follow up later. Next, please note this training session is being recorded and will be available to participants about one week after completion of this presentation. We'll try to get it up sooner, but uh, we can't make any guarantees. So about one week after, it should be available to you. Next, please note that this is part one of a three-part series. The webinar series is entitled Using Precision Agriculture Technologies to Improve On-Farm Economic and Environmental Sustainability. Uh, there is going to be, as I said, three parts. Parts two and three are being worked on at this time, and they're not necessarily done because, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be covering timely soybean agronomy topics. Now, the first one, as with the title today, is around planting. We'll have one around in-season management and then one around the harvest and post-harvest period. So to be on the lookout for these, we'll be um, advertising the in-season one, talking about the title, giving you the uh, presenter's name and everything here in the near future. But for now, be on the lookout for those, and we hope you join us in the future. Those two will be sponsored by United Soybean Board, so they should be free to you. Finally, please watch for future webinars that will be offered by the American Society of Agronomy in the coming months. We'll hope you join us for future events. Now with that, I want to get on to our speaker. Our speaker today is Dr. Joe Luck, who's an associate professor and precision ag engineer at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His responsibilities include extension, research, and teaching in areas related to the application of precision agriculture in crop production. His current research and extension efforts are focused on demonstrating ag data management strategies and technology applications for improving crop production efficiency. As many do in, in the precision ag space, he works closely with interdisciplinary teams to evaluate technologies. And some of these include crop canopy sensors, advanced pesticide application systems, multi-hybrid and variety planters, which is partially uh, the topic today, and grain harvest systems. Since 2015, he has served as a board member of the Ag Data Coalition, a group focused on improving agricultural data privacy, access, and utilization for producers. So with that, Joe, we thank you for coming today, and we look forward to hearing your message, and we look forward to answering questions at the end of this period. So when you are ready, feel free to show your slides and take it away. Thanks a lot. All right, Chris, thanks so much for the introduction and uh, thanks everybody for joining the webinar today. Looking forward to sharing some data and some information with you all that we've been collecting out here over the past couple, three years and, um, and look forward to helping out with any questions that anybody might have as we get going. I um, just wanna recognize a couple of folks that I've worked with quite a lot out here. Uh, former graduate student, Rachel Stevens, that worked on this uh, multi-hybrid planter project and then Laura Thompson, who is uh, our on-farm research uh, group coordinator, and they both have a lot to do with this work. So, so just uh, quickly, a few topics that we'll go through today. Um, Want to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing with variable rate seeding. We've uh, done some studies, as, as Chris mentioned, with multi-hybrid planters or really multi-treatment planters would probably be a better way to describe that. I won't spend too much time, but just showing we're going to be talking a lot about data and just show a couple of applications with fungicides and insecticides because it's very relevant to the data processing that we're going to do. And then kind of at the end, I'd, I'd like to share with you a little bit of 
some do's and don'ts, I think, in terms of how to set up on-farm research so you can do some of this on your own farms or, or within your grower's farms to really get some of the best data that you can get. So we'll start off here um, talking a little bit about some of the work we're doing with variable rate seeding for soybean production. And one of the neat things is a lot of folks have uh, access to variable rate planning for soybeans now. Out here in Nebraska, the bulk of the folks that I work with are probably on 30 inch rows, uh, quite a few on 15 inch rows, not very much, not very many doing seven and a half inch rows. Um, but a lot of times they're planting soybeans with the same unit that they're planting corn with. So they have a variable rate uh, system. And, you know, one, one such uh, planter shown here on the left, McKinsey, that's the actually the planter we did our multi-hybrid testing with, but also did corn planting with that. Uh, the unit there on the right, that's the old Deer 750. This is the system that I grew up on in western Kentucky and uh, put a lot of put a lot of hours on one of those. Um, obviously a lot more challenging if we're going to do, you know, variable rate seeding with one of those systems with, uh, you know, with manual setting. Not impossible though. <clears throat> so we have, um, we have quite a few options when we talk about uh, creating in-field trials for, for variable rate soybean production. This is one example and, and I'll share later, this is all available through our on-farm research network, but this is just uh, a common setup we might do for um, an infield trial where we're using field link strips and maybe the operator is just changing these these seeding rates um, manually. So a lot of times in the cab or or maybe stepping out of the cab to make a quick adjustment. But um, essentially, we're we've got two things, and you'll hear me say these terms quite a lot over the next 45 minutes. But you know these strips are replicated, so we have you know, multiple instances of, for instance, 116,000 seeds per acre. Um, so those uh, those are replicated throughout the field in these blocks of four. You know, we have our four seeding rates you can see there. Another opportunity that we have is actually now to use our prescription maps and in our variable rate controllers to lay out even more complex um, Field trials. So this is an example of a project that we're associated with University of Illinois' lead institution, and uh, and the project is called Data Intensive Farm Management. But essentially, we're using precision ag technologies to put in small, randomized, replicated blocks of different treatments out in in sub areas within our field. So this is <clears throat> one such study. We'll come back to this one quite a bit here over the next little bit. And uh, this was done in 2018 with one of our growers out this way. So you can see what I'm talking about here. Now I'm, we're talking about blocks. So you see the highlighted area there. This first block here has um, our four treatments located within it. So we have our seeding rates there. You can see 100,000 to 175,000. Our grower rate in this instance would have been 150,000 seeds per acre. That's kind of their selected rate. So we're just trying to show what uh, increasing or decreasing seeding rates might mean here. And that gap that we have is pretty important. We want to make sure that the equipment can provide that, um, that distance between our, our target rates. And one of the nice things is if you look at this study, we have actually, if you count up, we have 16 different blocks across the field with uh, these different um, four treatment rates associated with them. So a lot of data there. I, I can't stress enough how important as applied data is, especially when you're doing these type of trials. So this uh, this is an example of the as applied data that came from within that study. And you, you can pretty much tell these these colors that we're seeing here kind of correspond to, to what we just saw. Um, the controllers don't always respond exactly like we'd want them to. So you can see some areas in, in these different blocks, especially down here in the the southeastern half where you know we would expect to see that yellow color uh, in these blocks as opposed to you know the the boundaries around that 150,000 seeds per acre so we really have to as we do on farm research we really have to think about collecting that as applied data so that we can go back and verify what was put out in the field is what we intended to put out in the field and we'll see some more instances of how important this can be in a, in a little bit. 
Um, if we look at this particular field, so this is this is the results from uh, from this one study that we did. So we have our four seating rates here in the left-hand column. Um, we have summarized for all of our treatments, our moisture content, our dry yield, our marketable yield. And then one thing that we'll come back to and talk about quite a lot is our marginal net return. So what that includes then is not only the, the, the price that we get for our soybean, our dry yield, but also the cost of our seed in those different treatments. <clears throat> we actually wanted to have 16 uh, blocks so 16 replicates out in the field. But as it turned out, due to several things, um, the as applied data, yield monitor data, things like that, we actually only ended up with eight full blocks where we had all four treatment or seeding rates um, adequately uh, represented within those blocks. So that's just another challenge we have to kind of think about with some of this data. Um, ha but having eight replicates is, is really a good thing. And where you can start to point that out is in our yield data, you can see that these letters behind our yield are the statistical indicators. So if I have an A beside any one of these values, that means they're not statistically different. And, and there's a couple of other factors that can affect that, not only the number of reps, but also the in-field variability. So if we have a field with a lot of variability, that could affect these. But what you can see is, really the only significant yield difference we see is between the 65 bushels an acre and the 62 bushels an acre. And so we have an A for 65 and a B for 62. But what that tells us is because of all the replicates we have in this study, we're actually able to detect pretty small uh, yield differences statistically. Now again, this is another thing is because we this field in particular doesn't have a lot of variability. We'll, we'll be doing some future analysis on that. Um, unfortunately, this fall, um, it pretty much rained, snowed, and froze immediately after harvest, so we weren't able to go in and collect our soil texture information to, to further that analysis. But the very interesting thing is, and I think that's where we have to go with all this uh, data in the future, is when we look at marginal net return, we can see then that there is a statistical difference between the chosen or what our producer would have gone with, 150,000 seeds per acre, versus the two lower seeding rates. So we, I feel pretty comfortable in telling that grower that in this case, he probably should have or could have cut seeding rates by about 25,000 seeds per acre and probably would have made about $25 an acre, at least across that particular field. <clears throat> One of the biggest challenges that we have kind of run into with these systems, obviously, is the, uh, you know, the header width and the planter width. It's, it's not quite as easy as corn. I don't think anybody I've worked with so far has had the same planter width as they have had a, a header width for soybeans. Most of the folks out here are running 35 foot headers with 30 uh, foot planters. So what we have to do is use multiple planter widths. We'll talk a little bit more about that here when we get into kind of the data uh, post-processing step, but it's really important to think about that when we set up our field trials. If you're not going to take the time to harvest, you know, with, right down the middle of where you might have planted stuff, and certainly if we think about split planter studies, that's another thing to think about with um, with soybeans. We may not be able to do that very effectively if we have a 30-foot planter and a 35-foot header because we're not going to be able to harvest just 30 uh, 30 feet. One thing I would point out is um, back to yield monitor data quality, it's really, really important, especially in these 30 inch row situations that you're harvesting a consistent header cut width. You know, when, when we have 30 inch rows, it doesn't take a row or two to not get harvested down a strip and, and we could uh, affect our comparisons uh, down those strips. So that's pretty critical and especially in soybeans and in corn, but particularly in soybeans. Um, moving forward with our variable rate seeding. So I wish I had a, uh, a strong answer for what's what's the best target here, but we're working with, now that we know that we can collect this kind of data, we're working with our specialists out here really to figure out what kind of things we can target. I think a couple things that we've, we've kind of uh, talked about are areas with emergence issues. So if we do have uh, maybe soil crusting or something, maybe we need to try and up the population in those areas to ensure we have a good stand. Um, obviously, places with uh, 
soil moisture holding capacity. Those are areas where we think we could, you know, potentially push yield down the road. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, we, I just continue to hear people say, well, that just push uh, soybean seeding rates higher and higher in areas of the field that don't yield as well. And we don't know why. And I'm just not, I'm not sure I've bought into that quite yet. So we have, we have the ability to collect a lot of this data. And there's been a lot of people interested in, you know, that yield gap analysis in soybeans. And I think the data that we can collect through these types of studies is really going to help us answer some of those questions. But the one thing I would come back to is, and we really try and talk to our producers about this, is it's not about yield. And especially if we think about products and things like that, if, if it costs me $20 an acre to apply this product or apply more of a product and I, and I, I see a three bushel yield bump, Maybe that's significant, but it's not paying for itself. So we have to think about um, marginal net return when it comes comes time to finalize these analyses, or else we're going to be, you know, just continuing to to work in the red in, in some cases. <clears throat> so I just wanted to move on to uh, some of the work that we've done then with our multi hybrid planner. So this is just kind of a case study in soybean production. We actually did this uh, use this platform. Um, have to thank Kinsey for loaning this unit to us over, over a couple of years. Um, we did some drought tolerant corn offensive hybrids, but really to spread the use of the system out, we wanted to try and target sudden death syndrome in soybeans. And we, I'm sure that that's an issue that I, I recall growing up and, and it's an issue out here in Nebraska. Um, but you can see some of the details on how that, how that uh, infection can spread and, and what are some favorable uh, environments for that. So uh, the idea was if we could find some growers that had uh, locations that that they had experienced sudden death syndrome in the past, could we target those areas with a product that uh, I believe uh, uh, Bayer has come out with um, this uh, Alevo product that is a seed treatment. So that's done, you know, um, before we load the seed into the planters. So there's not much difference there. But it's been shown in some cases to reduce the uh, the the yield loss in in terms of sudden death syndrome pressure. So again, thinking about we call them multi hybrid planters, but maybe multi treatment planters might be a better term in this case. You know, essentially one bulk tank here contains our treated seed, and the other bulk tank contains a, a seed that was not treated with this product. Both I would say both of the seeds that we planted were some of the highest uh, SDS tolerant seed that the company Pioneer that we were working with actually had to offer. So there was already some of that built into those seed. We estimate the cost of that product at about 15, a little over $15 per acre. So this is an example on the right. Um, you'll see here that uh, one of the prescription maps, what you see again is a lot of randomized replicated plots. And we have two, you know, essentially two treatments here but what we're trying to do is develop these two zones. So this standard zone would indicate an area where we don't think SDS pressure has been prevalent. The lighter colored zone here on the kind of the northeast part of the field, that's where we think that sudden death syndrome may have occurred in the past. And again, that's based off of a couple things. One is historic yield maps. The growers we worked with had been collecting yield data for a few years. Um, another, uh, tactic we would use is, is if, if our um, our cooperators had georeference crop scouting information. So one of the folks that we worked with actually was a crop scout and had documented um, and confirmed SDS pressure in specific areas of this field, which helped out a lot. So, um, and again, we, we would process those two together. We used a, a this management zone analyst, but there's several software packages out there you could use to try and take you know, that existing yield data and, and try and create these zones. But essentially what we're trying to do is test those in multiple locations here across the field. And here's another <clears throat> another image on the right of a, a different field. This was an irrigated pivot. And again, you can see those lighter colored areas where we would have the elevo pressure. And those would actually be the areas where we would have placed that elevo product. So you can see that, for instance, within this, zone that would have had sudden death syndrome pressure, we've placed then seed with the treatment in these blocks, and then we've placed this untreated seed, and that's how we're trying to, to check that uh, that response. Um, 
you can kind of see there again, we, we do statistical analysis on that similar to what we just talked about to, to look at our marginal net return. <clears throat> you know, just talking about the data that we have, again, the, the inset image in here, this is our as applied planning data. So the Kinsey system returns to us, you know, not only seeding rates and other information, but it tries to tell us where it um, switched row units on and off to actually put that that hybrid or that treatment where we intended it to. So we can use that as part of our quality control check. Um, you can see the yield monitor data here on the right that was collected by the, the cooperator. One thing I'll, I'll mention is we do try and um, post-process or clean all of the yield monitor data that we get. It, it doesn't take one or two points with really excessively high yield values to to confound an analysis that we might do. Of course, you can get around some of that by collecting more yield data points. Um, typically, we try not to use less than 300 feet of, uh, of harvester path to go into our analysis. That 300-foot that strip uh, helps average out some of that error, but we do have sometimes points that are collected that are just extremely high or extremely low, and it's important to, to remove those from our, our data summary. So interesting, uh, results here. Um, we've got <clears throat> four fields that we were pretty successful in applying the the treatment uh, where we intended to and, and got some good yield monitor data. You can see in the first field <clears throat> that essentially um, the Elevo product did better in both zones. And again, you can see we've got statistical indicators here. That was, there was really no significance. So Bottom line is there was there was no difference we can 100% attribute to that Alevo product causing that difference there. When we look at the second field, um, there's a significant difference between that SDS zone and the standard zone, but in terms of within each zone, these Bs indicate that that those two uh, values for the Alevo product placed in the zone where we had SDS probably did not have a, a significant return, although there was a slightly higher marginal net return. And the same in the standard zone, um, we did have slightly higher marginal net return. So this is kind of the hypothesis we're testing, and we saw that play out, but we just did not see that in terms of um, the different products within each respective zone. Now in the third field here, uh, we did see quite a response, uh, especially in that SDS zone. So if you look at the Alevo product, that was $608 an acre uh, marginal net return when we used the Alevo product compared to the, the untreated seed, which was about $530 an acre. In the zone where we didn't see so much, uh, or we did not expect to see so much SDS pressure, we did see the higher marginal net return for our untreated seed. But again, not statistically, you can see that with the two A's behind those two values there. However, that response did follow again from the previous field. And in the third, fourth field that we worked with, um, we actually just did not see a statistical uh, response here. And in fact, the standard or untreated seed outperformed in terms of marginal net return compared to the Alevo product. So interesting results, um, not, not conclusive. I think that just goes to show we're not gonna see um, you know, that level of pressure, uh, there's several different things that could have affected why we saw such a issue here in this particular, this field NB. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the things that makes this really difficult is even year to year issues can affect us that, you know, that we might see a, a really good return in some years and not quite so much in others. Um, for that particular field, the one that had the highest response, it, it was quite, um, Quite a bit higher. We actually had a $78 an acre gain using that treatment in the areas of the field where the producer had had the previous history of yield and georeference crop scouting for SDS. Um, when we put the Alevo in the, the zones that that was not quite as much documented, it actually would have resulted in a $14 per acre loss. If the producer, and this, this comes back to really putting all that together, if the producer had been able to plant just Elevo in that, that lighter colored zone and then not use that seed treatment on the rest of the field, there would have been about a $4,000 potential gain just in uh, that particular year 
um, using that type of application. And that would probably pay off that technology in about five years. So um, it's really something I think to, to keep our eye on. And, and you'll hear me say this again, but when we have those issues that are fairly persistent and sudden death syndrome is one of those, I think we'll see the opportunities here to really apply these technologies uh, much more quickly. So really the we, we kind of talk about this when we get into the conversation about on-farm data benchmarking and you know all this data folks have been collecting for you know the past 10 15 years there is a lot of value to that we would we would not have really been able to do this this study quite so well if if the grower didn't have uh, a good yield history and and in particular for this field very well documented crop scouting confirming that that disease um, you can kind of see in the image here on the right so this is uh, some aerial imagery that we collected during the growing season, this NDVI, and you can actually see pretty clearly where a lot of those areas where the untreated seed was in those uh, SDS zones that you can actually see the plant suffering in the imagery. And of course, one thing we didn't think about was um, it's a soil-borne disease. So every time we move through the field with, uh, with an implement, we have the ability to spread that. And so one thought was we, we probably needed to expand our zones a little bit, but um, but again, that's uh, something that we really have to consider in the future is those uh, those management zones may not be static. And in fact, I think that's a pretty safe bet that they're not gonna be static. <clears throat> so just quickly, I don't, I don't wanna touch on this too much, but since we're talking about precision ag data and, and kind of moving into digital agriculture, um, I know the next webinar will be more on in-season applications, but just thinking about uh, all these data layers we've kind of been talking about, thinking about uh, what are some other applications we talk, or at least I hear a lot about in soybeans, um, fungicide and insecticide is just another example of that. And um, how can we use our as applied data from those uh, applicators out in the field to really verify what's been done? And so here's, you know, this is an example of, uh, um, I think this might have been in corn actually, but but you can see the as applied data. This this uh, grower was trying to do these uh, strips throughout the field, applying this product with his uh, sprayer, and then leaving off spots where you know he he wanted to do a check. And that's that's what we need to really be doing here. We don't we don't need to go out and spray the whole field and 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 say that we you know feel like we had a response. We really need to alternate these applications and no application areas so we can try and get a better handle on that. Another thing to think about here too would be wind direction um, at the time of application. <clears throat> and uh, nobody wants to use the, the D word drift, but if, you know, if the wind was blowing from the north or south in particular in this field, we might really need to think about that in terms of the data that we use. So there's just another example of not necessarily a precision ag data set, but a, another key piece of data set when we work on those type of studies. So um, th this is all, I think, really, uh, really important stuff to think about. You know, here's kind of when we separated the data out for this person, looking at the areas that were treated, not treated, and then, you know, using our our post-process or edited yield data to, to try and draw some conclusions there. Uh, that's, I think, key. Oftentimes, we, we kind of take for granted what the uh, what the operator may or may not have changed out in the field while they were applying. <clears throat> kind of the next area we'll spend a little time on here, I think, is just really critical. The more and more I I work in this space and and talk to folks, uh, setting up on farm research, really to get, I think, quality data that's going to help us make the best decisions that we can make. And um, so I tried to outline this in just a few steps, and <clears throat> I'll go through that. I think step one through four or five here. Um, but, you know, the first step is is kind of sitting down and, and deciding what you really want to look at. So, you know, you may have heard of a new product that's out there or, um, you know, thinking about switching management techniques. But first thing is, you know, try and do a little bit of homework on what's been done before. And not only, not to say that you don't need to go ahead and do the study if it has been done, but, but understanding how others went about it uh, can give you some good ability to benchmark against what they did. This image here um, in the bottom right is our, our example out here in Nebraska, the on-farm research network, which has been around much longer than I've been out here, um, actually now has an online interface where you can go in and check 
previous studies, maybe in your area, but certainly studies that are related to, um, if you're looking for soybean seeding rate studies or maybe fungicides and insecticides applied in uh, in soybeans. You know, I don't, research studies and, and published manuscripts sometimes are, are good to read through, I guess they are, but oftentimes we, we have a lot more uh, easily accessible resources out there in terms of what's been done and uh, and we can get this from, in, in particular, from the University of Nebraska's on-farm research website. So I know some other states are starting to develop some tools like this and just highly recommend that go back and kind of see what's been done and, and how things have been done to make some good comparisons. And again, I, I think I mentioned this before, but, you know, we we have a lot of variability in in-season weather, so that's something that, that can be persistent. but. Uh, but when we have those issues like SDS that, that show up quite frequently, uh, it, it just makes sense that those are the ones, if we have a treatment or solution, those are probably the ones we're going to see the, the quickest return for. Um, so as far as setting up the experiment and designing that, um, again, two key terms here. One is replicated and the other is randomized. And so again, if you look, uh, either one of these studies, if we we kind of observe this one in the bottom right corner, this field link strips. We have our four blocks for replication. So we have these four replicates. If you notice within each block, if we move north to south, the order of those replicates is not the same. So we don't always follow this first order, which actually just increases seeding rates. We start to randomize that within blocks. And what that does is it helps us remove if there's some yield trend or variability that that is a continuous trend across this field let's just say i've always had higher yield on the north side and always had lower yield as i move toward the south if we put those replicates in the very same order always across that field whichever one is at the bottom in this case like if 185 was at the bottom it's always gonna of those four it's always going to be the the lowest performer and so this randomization step is really critical even within our our small subfield blocks, you can see up here, if we look at block number one, which is the, the top uh, four kind of quadrant here in the upper left-hand corner, you see that that pattern is not consistent as we start moving down all these blocks in the field. So the ability to mix those up is, is kind of critical. And of course, if, if we're doing product A versus product B, don't forget about check strips in there. Um, and that's, you've seen that now in like our uh, multi-hybrid, multi-treatment study, and then even with our fungicide. Um, make sure those rates span quite a distance. So if it's if it's seeding rates in soybeans, we've always shot for 20,000, maybe 25,000 seeds an acre. Corn, you know, at least three to 4,000 seeds an acre. Um, nitrogen, probably at least 30 to 40 pounds an acre, things like that. Um, you know, we have to remember that the control equipment we're using a lot of times may not be able to precisely control that where we want. And we'll see some uh, good, bad, and ugly here uh, in just a second more on that. As you set up the study, don't forget, you know, we've got <clears throat> these applicators that are gonna put the study in. Then we have to think about if it's a sprayer or a planter, some other uh, unit, but then we have to think about our harvester widths. And so usually in our case, if we had, for instance, in this, two studies we did this year with 30 foot planters and 35 foot headers we tried to do 90 foot blocks so we try to do three planter widths and what that does is that ensures at least one harvester strip through each one of those blocks as we move across the field and the grower doesn't have to worry about um, you know picking what path he has to follow or he or she has to follow to get up through there um, another kind of varied in here is when we when we look at the amount of data we try and collect, we want that to try and be similar for each treatment. We don't want to bias our, our analysis one way or another if we collect, um, you know, for instance, 20 acres from one treatment and only 10 acres from the other. And and you can see here in our, you know, our image on the upper right here, if we, if we accidentally left this 150,000 seeds per acre, if we left that rate in this analysis, Maybe we just forgot to cut that yield data out. That would certainly bias the, the results. We'd have about 50 acres, you know, compared to, you know, quite a bit less than that here. So um, more along the lines of eight acres. 
Yeah, and I just guess I would mention we have a website here, and I'll throw this up at the end. If you're interested in learning more about, you know, how to do some of this, we've got a, a great uh, resource, our on-farm research website through CropWatch at UNL. Uh, kind of moving on to set three. So we've kind of done our background work. We've set the study up. Um, just collecting as much data as, as you possibly can. And this can be time consuming and um, and sometimes it's just not possible. But, uh, you know, some of the data we really have to get is, is our, for example, our as applied data. If there is an opportunity to do some scouting in season to look for issues, maybe collect you know, uh, maybe aerial imagery at a couple of critical time periods to, to see if other factors might have affected our yield across the field. That's that's pretty valuable data. We've we've used that a lot in uh, in corn studies, for instance, where we've had wind damage. We've actually been able to pick that up not just from the scout, but then also when we go back and look at imagery and and sometimes we need to pull that kind of data out of a, a study if if that's what we're doing. You can also learn some other pretty important things from that as well. Obviously, our yield monitor data, that's one of the, the, if it's good data, kind of the gold standard right now for comparing things. And of course, we'll talk or think about other data sets we might want to collect as well here in just a second. But just let me, <clears throat> let me show you this example. So again, this is our, our soybean seeding rate study field here um, on the left, our treatment design. What you see in the center picture, that's our as applied data. So you can kind of see the color, the points follow that. So this was actually, we did not realize that our grower was going to plant this at an angle out in the field. Um, so in this case, having those 90 foot or three planter passes wide blocks and then having those blocks about 300 feet long really paid off or, or this could have been kind of a disaster in terms of a research study. Um, but what we're able to do is using our as applied data is go back in compare you know what was planted in these areas versus what we intended and so what you see here in gray are the locations where the planter um, the as applied data indicated plus or minus 10 percent of our of our target rate maybe that needs to be plus or minus five percent but but you understand where i'm coming from is we actually kind of have an idea now within each one of these treatment blocks um, where the system did an appropriate job of planting the seed if we move that to the next step, so the, the next thing that was interesting was the, the grower didn't harvest the soybeans in this case in that same uh, same fashion or that same orientation that it was planted. So the, the harvest actually went uh, just pretty much east and west here. You can see these blue dots are the harvester data points that were collected essentially within each one of those um, areas that were planted what I would consider effectively. Um, we we have to do a little bit of further post-processing. So you, I guess the one good example is in the very bottom of this, you see this kind of loan, a couple of yield monitor data points down here. <clears throat> we would probably, or we would remove those. Our goal is to have some nice, long, consistent harvester strips where we can pull out data um, that, that, you know, represents that, that 300 feet or so of, of length. And really the bottom line there again is we're looking at, you know, trying to minimize the error from, from some of these other factors during the yield data collection process. And being able to collect that many points uh, really helps to buffer some of that. And if, if you go back and look at some of the literature, that's, that's essentially what, what's been found in the past is uh, somewhere along the lines of neighborhood approaching 300 feet. If I have a strip of yield monitor data that long, that's going to, be within a certain error of what the weight, if I were to weigh that amount of grain. So this is just an example of how we can use the as applied data. We can go back in and look at the yield data and uh, and try and find those areas where we really feel like we have conducted our study well. So what you see is, unfortunately, and I mentioned this earlier, out of 16 blocks, we only process eight. So you see this bottom left treatment block, we wanted 125,000 seeds an acre. Um, that just did not happen. I think the, the grower might not have had the variable rate system engaged when they did their field boundary. So that block was left off. And so essentially we, uh, sorry, that treatment within that block was not planted appropriately. So we actually just eliminated that entire block. 
and um, I think there are some ways you can get around that uh, through analysis, but but we just wanted to go with every block that we had, a solid set of planter data and a solid set of yield monitor data. So what are some of these other data sets we should think about? Well, you know, geo-reference is the, the word of the day. We need to not only look at, um, you know, what, what issues are going on, but we need to record where they happen. So there's tons of apps out there for that now. You know, the old uh, handheld Garmin's was kind of one of the way we started doing that, but just marking where we're seeing out in the field. So certainly for soybeans, it's nice to get an idea of emergence, um, stand counts, and then maybe even stock counts at the end of the year. Um, one of the great things about working in, at a university is we have a lot of expertise um, in terms of folks that can help us with looking at disease pressure, pest pressure, and kind of documenting that um, in, in some of these studies. One example is uh, stem bore and soybeans. Uh, one hypothesis is that at lower seeding rates, there appears to be larger stems and are those less susceptible to pests. And that's one of the things that we'll be trying to document this year in, in our field studies. So um, there may be some correlation there. Uh, aerial imagery, again, that gives us some great insight. Crop scouting is good, but then we can actually take those um, locations and maybe relate that across the field. There's some other things we've been thinking a lot about, and we've seen uh, really successful data collection in this, but, you know, what are some other things that affect our bottom line? Um, you know, it, for me, in the end, it's, it's got to come down to economics, but, you know, did other factors have a play in what, we, what we've learned? So did... Uh, did moisture, grain moisture, was that impacted? Uh, was harvest speed impacted? Did did we have to slow down and, and actually lose productivity because of that? Uh, were there issues with grain quality that we need to, to think about? We we just need to start thinking more about this, I think, from a systems approach so that we really do have a full picture of, of what we studied and how it might have impacted the, the entire uh, production system. So, uh, a little bit of discussion here about the one of the final steps, but really it's getting toward this data analysis step and, and trying try to turn that into decisions. So again, the data analysis for me, first step is get that as applied data, try and check to make sure things were planted the way we intended them to or applied the way we intended them to. Um, yield monitor data, and I can provide more information on this, but if we just take raw, if we just take raw yield monitor data files and try and dump those into an analysis, usually that ends up causing issues. And um, I don't have an example in this presentation in soybeans, but I have a example in corn where just because of the yield monitor data, if if we used a raw file versus one where we've done some post processing, we would have basically reached a, potentially a couple different conclusions. And so that's a really important step. We've got some resources out there on that if folks are interested. Sometimes you can do that without extra software and issues, but uh, there's some neat neat software from USDA called Yield Editor that helps. And I know a lot of the companies are trying to build these uh, data processing tools into their packages to mitigate some of those uh, yield monitor errors. You know, what, what were the other in-season issues that we can bring in? <clears throat> um, obviously, we want to get to subfield variability in a lot of cases um, if it exists. So just kind of back to our statistical analysis again, in our results from this field trial, uh, had there been a lot more variability within this field, we probably may not have seen any yield differences here whatsoever. Um, that's, that's one of the things that can affect, you know, when we plan how many replicates we want for a particular study, but uh, just something to think about um, how, you know, how did the, the differences we observed in, you know, marketable yield, moisture maybe, but, but economically, what was the difference? That's really, uh, really important. Um, I guess the big question that, that a lot of people will ask, you know, is it, is it worth the time? So what I thought, what I thought I might do is just kind of just run through a quick scenario here. I like, I like looking at some of the data. So this is, again, our, our study here on the right. Um, what you're seeing on the chart here is our soybean yield for each of those treatments within each one of those blocks. And, and as expected, what you kind of see is it's a little bit all over the place. I think you can, 
you can start to see a trend where most of the blocks, the the lowest seeding rate actually had the highest yield out of all. But again, you know, from our from our data here, the only one we know is that it was statistically different than this 150,000 that the grower used. But I guess when I um, we see a lot of studies where you know I might use the grower, I might have a variable rate approach, and then I might just drop one block of the the grower's existing uh, approach in there. And I guess that's that's what I'm trying to get at here when we start talking about um, why we do this randomization, why we do this replication. So let's flip over and start looking at our our marginal net return um, for this field. You know what you notice is out of eight blocks. Um, we have a fairly consistent trend in terms of, you know, our lowest seeding rate. It, it was always the most uh, most profitable, and, and it kind of goes all the way from there up to our highest seeding rate, which was least profitable. So what is that? One, two, three, four, at least five blocks. That was, that was kind of the trend. So what's interesting is if we look at just two of those blocks, and so I've got block two circled here in red, and then I've got block six circled in red, if we'd only put one of those strips of four throughout the field, we would have gotten a different story from that. And so in each of those blocks, there would have been a slightly higher uh, marginal net return from the second seeding rate. Um, and then thinking again back to this, you know, I'm going to throw a fresh variable rate approach across the field. And then I'm just going to stick in one block of maybe a higher rate or a grower rate or maybe my grower comparison rate. So what I did here was I circled in blue these two instances of, you know, my grower rate was 150,000. Um, let's say I'm pushing seed saying you need to plant more. Well, two times I would have actually gotten a, a positive from that. But when we look across the field if, with all those replicates, that's certainly not the case that we saw. Um, in fact, you know, there was even in marginal net return, there was really no no difference there. So that's just one of the things I think we have to really keep in mind as we move forward. I think there's a lot of value and and it is clear in being able to have these replicates out through the field and not just throwing one block. We we need to make sure that we're getting um, a, a similar story across that field. Um, or if we start looking at subfield zones understanding how those different rates might actually have an effect if, if we were to continue studying a, maybe a rate response instead of just a comparison between two rates. So I guess the, the, the bottom line I come back to is, well, if I'd, have, if I'd have thrown out, if I'd have just put block two out in the field, I probably would have gotten a different story if I'd have put block six out there. Um, even if I'd have just done rate comparisons between my rate and a higher rate or, or my rate and that higher rate, a couple of instances here, you know, I might have might have thought, well, planting the highest seeding rate might be the best best option, but that, as far as the entire field goes, that's just clearly not the case. So, um, just a couple of extra parting thoughts here, and try to leave some room for questions. But um, you know, best management practices in terms of not just how to set the studies up, but but how you extract the data, how you uh, process the data. That's uh, I think that's just key moving forward when we do these kind of studies, and it's it's getting easier with the tools we have, and we we have a lot of uh, cooperators out here that they can almost do most of the stuff themselves, and um, and, a, and a few can. So I think uh, this is something that's going to continue to pick up steam, and as the data processing tools get easier, I think this is just something we're going to always want to be doing some checks year to year, and again thinking about that that technology solutions you know if we're talking about row shutoffs or auto steer you know we can we can pencil out some quick returns there for that but some of these other variable rate solutions we talk about or or multi-treatment or multi-hybrid solutions that year-to-year -year variability plays such an important role on how long it takes us to see a return and and i think a lot of times uh, maybe we are chasing ourselves down a rabbit hole to, to find something when it's just not there. But in some situations, maybe it's just uh, we just didn't have the right conditions for that to to show itself. And, and another example of that is, is, you know, just back to our SDS study, we had, you know, two out of the four fields had a, a return. 
only one of those was significant when using that SDS. So were the, the field conditions right uh, to manage that risk of having that? You know, in our offenses, offensive and defensive corn studies, we we had two of the best years in terms of rainfall uh, that we'd had in a long time in the growing season. And so kind of what that shows you is you don't need really much drought tolerant hybrid if you have those conditions. But, um, you know, thinking about the risk, what is the risk of having a drought? One of the interesting things we found was in most cases that drought tolerant hybrid didn't really have a yield penalty compared to the offensive hybrid. So that kind of gets you back to thinking, well, how many years do I need to see that severe enough drought conditions where that, that actually pays off? Um, if there's no significant difference, well, that could be, uh, uh, in most years, that could be something really to think about. So um, a lot of times we we want to kind of do a one-year study and, uh, and, and come to some conclusion, but in most cases, we need to be kind of working with these systems over the course of time to see what that's going to be like. So um, just some some thoughts there. Uh, we've got a lot of resources. Again, uh, our, we're reworking our, our Precision Ag website in the process of doing that right now. But in terms of on-farm research, our uh, crop watch site you see down there at the bottom, it's got a lot of great resources on it. Um, there's my contact information, and I'm always glad to visit with folks, even if you're not in Nebraska, um, about what we're doing or maybe how to set things up to to get good information. But um, with that, I think I would just say I wish everybody a safe 2019 growing season. I, w I wish I could affect crop prices and weather, but I'm not to that point yet. But, uh, but I hope everybody has a, a healthy and safe year. So thank you all for attending today. Great. All right, Joe, thank you so much. We appreciate that message and all the, the great data and, and figures you showed. Um, we're going to get started now. I have a, a series of questions to begin with where people are wondering a little bit more about your actual trials and some of the specifics around them. So the first one, were the beans in the trials determinate or indeterminate? Do you happen to know oh, that's a really varieties? That is a really good question. I do not know that right off the top of my head. Um, if, if you ask that question and, and if you can send me a note, I can find that out and get that to you. That's a great question. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry, I don't have the answer to that. One. It's all right. It's okay. I understand. It's hard to remember every detail from a trial. Um, hopefully remember this one. If not, we'll have another follow-up. What were the planting dates on these trials? Were any of these planted early? Uh, let's see. That is a good question. Um, I'm not sure if I can get to that. Let me think here. Let's see if I can dig this up. Um, planting date is really, really critical. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's kind of familiar with um, the rule of thumb. We've had some great folks out here work with um, soybeans over the the course of history, and and I think the don't quote me on this, but it's something like after May 15th, it's every day you delay, you have a probability of losing a half a bushel per acre. So um, a lot of the folks, even even some of the folks we're working with this year, they're starting to plant beans not long after, you know, they used to plant corn and switch over to beans, but now they're starting to get in there, um, get in there almost as, as they go. So the planting date, the field that I showed you throughout that, uh, example, the planting date was May the 9th, and the other study that we did was planted on May the 16th. So we, we've got a lot of folks that are trying to get out there, uh, you know, by that May 15th or, or so. Gotcha. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, all right. We've got some other questions rolling in here. Um, another one, which is kind of in, <laughs> along the same line. Um, what were the differences in maturity between the seeding rates? So what was observed with regards to crop maturity between the different seeding rates in your trial? Uh, that is also a good question. And what I, what I will tell you, I, I've got our on-farm research book here in front of me now. Uh, the variety for the field site that I showed you with the variable rate seeding was an ASGRO variety, AG29X8. Okay. Um, and so if, if anybody wants to look up, as far as, um, 
when we when we kind of got out and looked at the field, I don't think we noticed any effects on uh, in terms of seeding rate. We really didn't see a lot of differences. The uh, that's something we probably could go back and look at maybe some aerial imagery, but uh, and I know in the, uh, the other field that we did in the study, which interestingly enough, average yield was about four. 52 bushels per acre, whereas this field was 62 bushels per acre. So again, thinking about that that yield gap, um, I don't recall any issue, any differences there either. So, mm -hmm. okay, I appreciate that answer. Thanks much. Um, to the practical side now, how much additional time is required to run these on-farm tests, and is it economical for most farmers? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think certainly when you think about um, this idea of creating prescriptions, um, you know, you're, if I were to sit down and draw one of these maps myself, and I've done it a few times, I mean, I'm, I'm talking at least an hour of time. And so that's, that's, it, that's something that you really have to think about. I think there's a lot of value in the data. Um, but you know, if you go that approach, it's definitely going to be something that you have to have a time commitment. Now, if you're doing the field link strips and, uh, you know, you, you want to uh, start looking at, uh, you know, the differences, just being able to harvest through those strips, you know, you can go back to the, the weight wagon. I mean, that's kind of been the way these have been done for years. Um, one of the things the yield monitors bring to the table is starting to incorporate some of those uh, those issues with field variability that does take some time and and so uh, you know I usually tell people well are you are you willing to and, and you know what's your time worth and what have you got to be doing during the winter months when you're running these analyses and um, and and can you afford to to spend that kind of time because for me there's no question time is money and mm -hmm. and you're if you're going to do it you have to invest that time you're not doing other things or you're going to pay somebody to do it for you but i think in the long run uh, a lot of the tools that some of the companies are bringing out there for folks to work with are going to make this a little bit easier to do and i think that could help us to reduce that time but right. uh, that's certainly a excellent point you're going to you're going to have some commitment one of the nice things about our on-farm research network is our our extension educators and our specialists here that you know we try and do a lot of that data processing for people, but we're also trying to trying to show people about what it's going to be like to do it themselves. Sure. Um, one more question, and then I'm going to show the audience um, a tool that has been launched by the United Soybean Board to help them in some of these precision ag technology selection decisions. But this this final question. Um, and actually, it's from multiple people. Um, do farmers approach the university for help when it comes when, in regards to data analysis? You know, you showed a lot of examples of statistical significance and lack thereof in many cases. You know, for a lot of people, that's a that's a difficult analysis. I mean, at the university level, let alone people who aren't routinely trained in that. So, how do you do these things properly, and how do you do a proper analysis, including the statistics? when you may not have some of the tools that a scientist may have at their disposal. Any comments on that? No, that's, that's a great point. We, we do that. I mean, that our on-farm research network exists because our, our growers will come to an educator or somebody out in the state or, or maybe somebody on campus with a question to research. And that's, that's kind of how this one out here got started. Um, that that is an excellent point it is re it is really challenging i mean the statistical analysis tools alone are are you know not that easy to work with but uh laura thompson that i mentioned earlier is actually working on a way to try and get a a, um, a online system out there where people could upload their results so if they had a strip trial to look at that but you know really it it comes all the way back to the the setup of the study and how you do that so but, but I think the more people that have an appreciation for that um, and, and can start asking questions, you know, I, I hate to single people out, but when people come to, to say like, well, this product increases yield by two or three bushels an acre, 
start to ask questions about, well, how did you test that? Where's that data come from? You know, was it, was it randomized and replicated? So I think it'll get easier um, um, the further we go, and that at least is my hope. And I know a lot of people are working in this space to try and make it so. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, that's it's a difficult issue to to conquer, and um, hopefully people come to you for some help because you seem to have well, a great grasp of this technology and how to use it. So I I would just say um, I I can't think of any anybody at university that would not be interested to to find a way to help you know their growers out if if they sure. came to them with a question about this and um, like I said that's that's something I know a lot of extension um, groups across the country are are not in as good a shape as ours but that's that's just kind of how this one got started you know probably 20 years ago and, it, and it's been it's as strong as ever so I'd say definitely utilize that resource if you have the opportunity absolutely couldn't agree more. So if people want to reach out to you, obviously we have your contact information on the screen right now. Hopefully folks have copied that down. We at the American Society of Agronomy can help get that to you um, if you want it. Otherwise, you could probably Google your name, Joe, and I suspect you'll find all that information. Um, I do want to share with the audience real quick. I've been asked by our sponsor, United Soybean Board, to, um, to show something that they've been working on. And let me show it to you, the audience, here a second. And that is what's called the USB Tech Tool Shed. So a little bit quickly about that, and you might have some interest in this, considering how we talked about multiple technologies and how to evaluate them. So as you can see, USB says on-farm technology and data management services help farmers make better decisions, boost efficiency, decrease inputs, increase yield, and be more sustainable. We saw evidence of that today in Joe's presentation. But there's not necessarily a lot of unbiased sources of information on that technology out there. So it's hard to navigate through the technologies. To address this issue, USB recently launched the Tech Tool Shed, which is a soy checkoff resource to help soybean farmers maximize the technology they currently have, integrate new technology, and manage lots of data, which we also saw today, which you can obviously generate through these studies. Um, Tech Toolshed helps soybean farmers investigate and adapt egg technology appropriate for their farm in, what is key here, incremental steps. It's a launch pad for helping soybean farmers implement technology and its data to improve best management practices and, of course, the bottom line. On your screen right there, you can see the website where you can go to to learn more about this, www.unitedsoybean.org backslash Tech Toolshed, or you can follow it on the Tech Toolshed, that is, on Twitter, at Tech Toolshed. So we hope you visit that. Take a look at this resource. It's there for you. And uh, take advantage of it. So again, we thank USB for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Big help here. Makes it free to you. Obviously, they're working in some other areas and providing other resources to you. So check out Tech Toolshed. Joe, thank you so much for this presentation. Very informative. Very science-based. We really appreciate it. And uh, as I said, folks, if you want to reach out to Joe for any support on these on-farm trials and evaluating these type of things, please do so. So thanks again, Joe. We appreciate your time. For all of those out there who are interested in the recording and the slides, I've had a lot of comments about that today. These will be available to you, both a non-editable version of the slides and a recording with both video and audio. So be on the lookout for that. With Joe, thanks again. We appreciate your time. Everyone out there, we wish you all the best. We hope you check back in for future webinars. Thanks for joining today, and uh, have a great day and a great rest of your work week. Take care, and bye-bye.